Okay, so great. Um, thanks for staying here for the last talk. Uh, I'm Vincent. And um, I'm going to continue uh, this thread on bandits, but here is where the risk comes in. And this is basically uh, work that combines uh, best arm identification and risk. Okay, this is joint work with two of my students, Yunlong and uh, Zixing from the National University of Singapore. Okay, so uh, there are a few terms here, some of which you already know, best arm identification, but I want to go slowly at the start to tell you about variance constraints and why we care. Okay, just so that we are all on the same page and I'm going to change notation. So here we are, the number of arms is going to be called N, capital N, all right? So each of the potential treatments of a particular disease could be one of the choices that we make. And the efficacies are unknown to us, say 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 0 0.2, and 0 0.5. And we'd like to find out uh, which, has the best, which drug has the best efficacy. All right, so at some point in time, the, the bandit game goes as follows. A scientist prescribes one of them to each lab animal, and the efficacy can be observed through a Bernoulli trial, say. So the best arm identification problem, as we have seen today, involves finding the best treatment using the smallest number of trials. Okay. Uh, this morning, I talked about the fixed budget setting, but today, but now, I'm going to talk about the fixed confidence setting. And we are going to look at a, a, a slight twist to the problem in which we have a UCB-based type analysis, type algorithm together with accompanying analysis that turns out to be rather tight up to constants. Okay, so here is uh, the, the notation, all right, uh, that we will use throughout this talk. All right? We have a total of capital N arms, each associated to an unknown distribution, and those distributions are called new I, all right? So just like in uh, standard multi arm bandits, at each round R or each time R, we're going to select an arm IR, which is a number, all right, based on the observation history. So that is the history. The history consists of, a part of the arm that we have chosen at time one together with the observation that is sampled from the unknown distribution. And two and three and so on and so forth up until R minus one. And each, at each point in time, we observe the reward from the unknown distribution. And based on this entire history, we select another arm. Okay, so that's the game, right? So the sequence of random variables is assumed to be IID across rounds and across all possible arms. Okay, so we want the, the standard best arm identification problem, as you know, is basically to design a policy to find the best arm with the highest expectation in the smallest number of rounds. Okay. As I mentioned, now we are in the fixed confidence setting, and this has been widely studied as well, but there is a twist to our problem. Okay. So in the fixed confidence setting, we fix a certain parameter delta, and we uh, want to try to find an arm i, want to try to find an index i, that is the maximum, that, that has the maximum uh, reward, expected reward, and this should happen with probability at least one minus delta. Okay, so all this is all very standard. Uh, so that we can uh, get used to my notation. Okay, so this is just an illustration of a three-arm BAI problem. At each particular round, only one arm is sampled and the reward is observed. So we have uh, these arms here and we sample them and it looks like, um, looks like the red one is the best empirically. Certainly the third one is the worst, okay? So, okay. But the, the motivation for our work is the following, okay? So in some settings, you might want to obtain, you might want to learn an arm that is consistently good in terms of its expected reward, but its uh, variance or its variability or some notion of risk should not be too large, okay? So here you have got two different treatments that my, my student plotted out. And you can see that, okay, so that, that dotted red line is the average treatment efficacy for the red treatment which is a risky treatment. And the blue one is the conservative treatment that seems to be more, you know, consistent across time. So which one will you choose? Will you choose the risky treatment or the conservative treatment? It depends on your risk aversion parameter, I guess. But some people might want to choose the conservative treatment even though its efficacy may not be that high, but we don't have sudden dips like this that could be very, very uh, terrible in terms of the 
uh, uh, efficacy on a particular person. So we want to try to mitigate this. We want to take some other statistic into account and not just the expected reward in this work. Okay. So another, and I stole these slides from Prashant. Okay. So uh, because we were doing some work on risk-aware bandits together. So and here's some very nice uh, slides to motivate the problem. So again, you know, another, another motivation is the following. We want to pick a route from our house to the office and we want to reach the office and record our reward, which is the negative uh, delay, okay? So oftentimes we want to uh, go to our office by a certain point in time, okay, for an important meeting. But then of course, the amount of time you travel on the road is a random variable. It depends on traffic conditions, especially in big cities like Bangalore. Right, so we might want to choose a particular route that whose expected time may be slightly longer, but the variability might be short, might be smaller, so that we almost deterministically get to our meeting on time. Okay, so yeah, so this, so you might want to you might want to choose the one that has a which one is better, right? So expected time here is eleven minutes, but the variance is like zero point one. Here, the expected time is slightly better, but you know you might get stuck in a jam. All right, so I'm not going to read out all these words. The point is that I might prefer root two. Okay, so there has been a lot of work in incorporating risk into the quality into the measure that we uh, optimize, as uh, I discussed with Prashant over lunch. So we have done some work in the mean variance, trying to design UCB-based Thompson sampling-based algorithms where what we care about is the a linear combination of the mean and the variance. There have been other works uh, as well for other risk measures. So in terms of risk constraints, that means we want, the, we want a policy that uh, outputs a certain option whose risk is bounded above by some reasonable number. Okay, so there have been fewer works and we want to explore this, uh, we want to explore this uh, problem and try to come up with upper and lower bounds that are almost tight, right? Okay, so let me try to be a little bit more formal and define the notion of an instance of our problem. So an instance of a bandit problem basically just consists of a bunch of distributions, n of them, a new i running from i running from one to capital N. So these are the unknown reward distributions in which uh, each of these distributions is assumed to have an expectation and a variance, both of which are unknown. Additionally, for the instance that we care about, there is also a permissible upper bound on the variance. Okay, so this is a number that you know, it's prefixed. You can tolerate this much variability in the time that you take to go to your office. No more. All right, plus minus five minutes is all you can tolerate. Okay. So that is a permissible upper bound on the variance that you know. So this is what I call an instance. It consists of all these uh, to five distri uh, uh, n distributions and a, a certain positive number. All right, so we are going to partition the set of all possible distributions, capital N of them, into some sets. The first is what we call the feasible set. The feasible set is a set of all possible arms whose variance is not larger than the permissible upper bound. So these are the options or these are the routes that I, 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 I'm okay with in terms of you know, its variance not being too large. All right, so the infeasible set is basically the complement of the feasible set. Okay, so just to remind, the feasible set is a set of all possible i such that the variance is not larger than the permissible upper bound. The best feasible arm is the arm that maximizes the mean among those arms that are feasible. Now, it, it may turn out that, uh, let me go slowly. It may turn out that in your instance, nothing is feasible, right? So <laughs> there, there is nothing precluding this possibility. And so in our algorithm, we also do a feasibility check to make sure that there is at least one item that is feasible. Then we can do some interesting analysis subsequently. All right. So there is another set known as a suboptimal set. The suboptimal set is a set of all possible distributions whose means are less than that of the best feasible arm, right? Than that of the best feasible arm. So the risky set, all right, now things are getting a bit more complicated. The risky set are basically those arms that are not suboptimal and not feasible. So those arms, all right, may be risky to us. 
So in bandit literature, people care about gaps. The size of these gaps measure the difficulty of the problem at hand. The smaller the gap, the harder it is to do hypothesis testing or differentiation between uh, two different distributions, right? So this, this is the mean gap. is basically the, the, the difference between the, best, the mean of any arm i and that of the best feasible arm i star, all right? Because we care about variances, we also care about the variance gap. That is the gap between the permissible upper bound and the variance of the particular arm that you are looking at. Okay, so that's the variance gap. The smaller these numbers are, the more difficult the instance as we will see. Yes? No, 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 it, it, there could be some, uh, yeah, so this, this sub-optimal set is basically all arms except I star. So, uh, so the, the, the sub-optimal set is basically, I think the sub-optimal, I in F, I think this I in the, Feasible, I suboptimal set, I in feasible, so should, sorry about the typo here. So mu i less than mu i star i in the feasible set here, and then this will not be empty. Yeah, sorry. How is it different from the infeasible set? Uh, so this, this includes the, so what, what is different from the infeasible set? So isn't this key set then the same as feasible set? Uh, let me see. So you could have, so let's see, so the suboptimal set, the set of all possible arms, set of all possible arms that is less than that of the best arm. So the risky set. Uh, so what do you want in the risky set? Either infeasible or not? Yes, infeasible or suboptimal. Oh, union of the Yes. Okay. okay, maybe this is uh, easier to understand here. So we have, uh, we can plot. Okay, all the, all the arms are a two-dimensional plane. The x-axis of the two-dimensional plane is the variance, and the y-axis is the expectation. So every possible distribution, we only care about its uh, expectation and its variance, and so it is, it is a point on this plane here. Okay? So, uh, so those arms, so here on the x-axis, there's a special point, sigma bar squared. That is the permissible upper bound on the variance. All the points to the right hand side of this upper bound, or to this, uh, all the points to the right hand side of the permissible upper bound, they are infeasible because the variances are too large. All right, all the points to the left hand side are feasible. And we are looking among all these feasible arms on the left hand side of the vertical line, we are looking for the one that maximizes the expectation, which is the red one. Okay, so this is the, uh, these are basically the, the sub. These are basically S, the set S here, right? And this is the risky set here, okay? Right, so our goal is the following, okay? First and foremost, we want to ascertain the feasibility of the instance. So the instance could turn out to have no feasible arms at all. Now, if the feasible set is not empty, then we, of course, want to find the best feasible arm. And we want to do this as fast as possible and with probability at least one minus delta. Okay. So, um, right. So in the rest of the talk, what I will do is I will show you an algorithm that does this job. And I will show you that, in fact, this algorithm is optimal in some sense by showing you a lower bound. I will also go through some elements of the analysis of the algorithm. Okay, so that is the agenda for the rest of the talk. So the first thing I want to do is to show you the result of the algorithm and the hardness parameter that is involved. Are you making any assumptions? Uh, no, they, they need to have, they're sub-gaussian, all right? Sub-gaussian, sub-gaussian, that's all we need.
sub gaussian is all we need of course you need to have like a mean and variance yeah yes bounded variance will give you bounded mean so having variance is enough we don't need gaussian assumption sub gaussian yeah that, that works for sub gaussian works for concentration bounds yeah and that's all we need. Okay, so um, this expression looks very scary, but I'm going to pass this for you. So let us define a hardness parameter, which is nothing but a function of all the gaps. Some of them that have superscript Vs, they are the variance gaps. Some of them that do not have Vs, they are the mean gaps. So the variance gaps are basically the difference between, absolute difference between the variance of arm I and the permissible upper bound. The mean gaps are all non-negative. They are basically the, um, the gaps between, the difference between the mean of a particular arm and that of the best piece of arm. Okay? So this is a particular expression that is a function of all these gaps. And uh, the idea here is the following, all right? The, the, the result is the following. Given an instance new, which is a set of all, which is a set of uh, n distributions and a permissive upper bound, upper bound, with probability at least one minus delta, our proposed algorithm, which I have not told you about, succeeds and terminates in this number of time steps. So that is the expected stopping time okay, of the particular algorithm. So here is the lower bound. We want to understand how good this is. All right? So given any particular instance with uh, sigma bar squared between zero and a quarter, uh, yeah, this comes back to your question. What sort of distributors do we care about? So why, why is it that uh, we have this condition here? Because we assume that the distributions that, are, are, the distributions that we care about are bounded and so have bounded support. And so this permissible upper bound, it only makes sense for it to be bounded. Yeah. So the, the point here of the lower bound is that the optimal expected stopping time or expected time of complexity or stopping time for any particular algorithm satisfies this relationship. So this log one over delta coincides with the log one over delta here. The, the main term is this HVA. VA stands for variance aware, by the way. H stands for hardness. So the leading term is the same. Okay. So the corollary is that uh, given any instance and variance threshold that is in a meaningful interval, all right, the best uh, stopping time satisfies the following, and it is achieved by our algorithm. So this is an information theoretic lower bound. We also have an algorithm that uh, has the same behavior up to constants. All right, so these constants here can probably be improved, which we didn't, uh, which we didn't do so. Okay. So I owe you. So this is the punchline of the talk. There is an algorithm, and there is a lower bound, and the algorithm has the same behavior in terms of the uh, the leading coefficient here as the lower bound. And now we are going to parse the the hardness parameter. Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. <laughs> it terminates with probability. This algorithm terminates with probability one. But what happens here if it, it terminates but it's wrong. wrong? Yeah. We can show it pro terminates with probability one. Yeah, you could just output anything you want, yeah. which could be wrong. Okay, so let me try to pass this thing here. Remember, we can partition the xy plane into four parts, right? So here there are four terms. So each of the terms has a meaning, all right, corresponding to each of the four parts. So now let's look at the first term here. This first term here uh, involves I star, best feasible arm. It always involves I star in terms of the mean gap and the variance gap. And there's a minimum here. Minimum means very small, all right? If the denominator is very small, then the hardness is very big, right? So what is the point of this term here? It is for us to ascertain optimality and the feasibility of the best optimal solution. Now, in order to ascertain the optimality of a particular solution, you need to pull the arm one over delta I star times by simple concentration. So this combines ascertaining optimality and feasibility of I star. The N here means min, all right? 
So now here, this set F intersect S is the feasible and suboptimal set. So these are the arms that are okay, feasible, but they are suboptimal means that they have less expected reward than that of the best arm. What, you do, what do you need to do now? All right? You need to ascertain something and to eliminate them. How do you ascertain? What do you need to ascertain? We need to ascertain that they are indeed suboptimal. All right? Suboptimal means that we only involve the mean gaps. All right? So we don't need to involve the variance gaps. We only need to say that, okay, these are suboptimal. I'm never going to have you in my, in my candidate, uh, you know, best arm, best feasible arm. The third one is the risky and infeasible arms. This, this R, risky, F, C, F complement is infeasible. As we need to ascertain infeasibility of the risky and infeasible arms. Now, because, you are inf because they are infeasible, we need to ascertain infeasibility. That involves the variance gap squared. All right, so we need to pull that this number of times. All right, finally, what do we have? Okay. They are arms that are both infeasible and suboptimal. Oh, those are the really bad people, all right? So because they are infeasible and suboptimal, ascertaining that they are either infeasible or suboptimal allows us to quickly kick them out of the game. So we have this max here. So I have explained everything to you here, all right? And hopefully everything here makes eminent sense. All right, so this actually, I mean, this is a punchline, all right? We have the hardness parameter, and the hardness parameter makes sense. We have an algorithm that achieves this thing that makes sense, all right? So I want, what, what else do we want to say here? Okay, so suppose we want to recover some results that are existing in the literature. You know, I, my background is information theory. So I, want, I like upper bounds and lower bounds that look almost the same which is what we have achieved. In information theory, the game we also play is, okay, we have a very complicated model. Let's say we simplify some elements. Can we recover results that uh, were existing many years ago? Okay, so here, yes, the, we are going to play the same game and we want to take sigma to go to infinity. Actually, sigma goes to one quarter plus epsilon is enough because as I said, sigma is one quarter is like the, the only, sigma being zero and one quarter is the only range that matters. All right, so as sigma becomes too large, now all these terms vanish, okay? Why, why do all these terms vanish? That everything is... Bounded than the variable. So yeah. Bounded. yeah, exactly. So the bound is one for one quarter. I think we assume the bound on the random variables is zero to one. So the variance is one quarter. A maximum variance is one quarter. So as sigma, as the permissible upper bound of variance is uh, tending towards one quarter plus epsilon, that's enough. Then many things cancel, and I'm going to walk you through why these things cancel, right? Because everything is now feasible, so we can get rid of this feasible set, all right? And here, there are also no, no more risky, there are no, no more variance gaps terms, okay? So this feasible set goes, this variance gap all goes, and now we can add up these two terms here, and we get a, H, a parameter, a hardness parameter that is the sum of the reciprocal of the squares of these mean gaps. And so this particularizes to something that uh, people we have seen before, the classical unconstrained result for best arm identification. Okay, there's the H1 term. Okay, so what I owe you now is what is the algorithm and maybe some elements of the analysis of the algorithm. Okay, let's see how far we want to go. Okay. So as with all these sort of algorithms, uh, you, can, you, you basically have to say that, okay, our estimation of the means and the variances are pretty good. And the way we do this is through some concentration results, very simple concentration results like Hofding and McDiamonds. All right, Hofding gives us this bound on the, on, the, on, the, on the means, on the empirical means, and McDiamonds gives us this bound on the variance. Okay, so you may wonder, right, what is so special about the variance? Why do we care so much about it? Actually, our work is also applicable to other risk measures as long as you can come up with something similar here. All right, so variance is nothing special. It's just a proxy for risk. You can do whatever you want. As long as you have something good here, then the subsequent analysis will propagate. If you have a result here that, that is worse by some constant factors, that, that constants will, those constants will propagate into the subsequent results. All right, so here we basically take the empirical mean, 
And here we take the unbiased sample variance, whatever. Okay? So we were conditioned on this event that all the uh, variances and all the empirical variances and the means are good. Okay, so, right? so with high probability, the true means and the variances lie in this upper and lower confidence uh, bounds, lie within this confidence intervals. And we are going to define this good event that, okay, the true means and variances at any point in time lie in these confidence intervals here. So that's a good event. So we're going to choose this epsilon carefully. We're going to choose it in this particular way. All right, and then uh, we want to, then this the epsilon here is designed so that this event E happens with probability at least one minus delta. Okay? Right, so we are going to condition on this event uh, from now on. Okay, so um, at this point in time, let me walk you through some of the interesting elements of this analysis here. So, I'm going to describe now our algorithm, which is called VALUCB. VA stands for variance aware, as I mentioned. LUCB stands for lower upper confidence bound. So our algorithm is a lower upper confidence bound based algorithm. Okay. So what we will do is the following. Okay. We will partition the arms based on confidence intervals. So again, on the x-axis here, you've got the sample variance. And on the y-axis here, you've got the sample mean. At a certain point in time, you're not very certain of the sample means and you're not very certain of the means and the variances of any of the arms. So for example, if you have a certain arm here, you've got uncertainty in two directions. One, the mean, oh, sorry, I'm pointing to the variance, and one, the mean here. So, all right, you have put this arm very few times, so the uncertainty is huge. Nevertheless, it's lower confidence bound for the variance is bigger than that of the permissible upper bound on the variance sigma bar squared. So this guy here, this blue guy here, is very, very likely to be infeasible. All the blue guys here are infeasible with high probability. Once, oh, okay, with high probability. And what, let's look at the left-hand side here, all right? The orange and the red, what can we say? It's, their upper bound on the variance is less than that of the permissible upper bound on the variance. So this point up here, and this, this is meant to be slightly to the left, all right? This uh, orange horizontal line here has upper bound on the variance less than or equal to that of the sigma bar squared. So those are very safe, very feasible, all right? We are very confident that they are feasible. Now, then there are a bunch of people in the middle who are confused. We haven't ascertained their feasibility yet, okay? So we are going to aggregate the green, red, and orange uh, sets into this thing called the possibly feasible set. Those are possibly feasible at a particular point in time. We have not ascertained that they are truly infeasible and we can throw them away. Okay? So, all right, at some point, so according to the LUCB principle, what we are going to do is we are going to identify the empirical leader. What is the empirical leader? We are going to look at the possibly feasible set that I talked to you about on the previous slide, and we are going to select the one that is the best, okay? So if I look at the left-hand side figure, who is the empirical leader? The empirical leader is uh, going to be chosen from the green, orange, and red sets. And who has the highest upper, who has the highest empirical mean? Green, this green guy. It is possibly feasible, and he has the highest empirical mean. Now, according to the LUCB principle, I'm sorry, we are going to also choose something called the empirical challenger. The challenger, you take away the empirical leader, you take away the empirical leader, and you're going to choose the uh, arm that, is, that has the highest upper confidence bound on the mean. Uh, who is this guy here? On the left-hand side, it will be the red guy here. Okay? So that is, the, that is one element of the algorithm, shown pictorially. Now, as you continue to pull arms and pull arms and pull arms, Confidence intervals will shrink, and what you get will be on the right-hand side. So what do you notice? What is the main change? This green guy here suddenly became blue. Hopefully, you're not colorblind. All right? So it has now been determined that the green guy is infeasible. And so at this point in time, the empirical leader becomes red. And the challenger becomes, I think, uh, orange, uh, or this orange guy, because it has roughly the highest upper confidence bound. Maybe the green is also a possible challenger. This green is a possible challenger. 
Okay, so this is how we proceed. We basically choose empirical leader and empirical challenger at each point in time. Okay, now when do we stop? Okay, when do we stop? Right? So we stop when uh, there are no more challengers. And when there are no more challengers, there is no one to challenge the best piece of the arm. All right? But before we can say that there is no more challenger, there will be potential challengers. So we are going to keep the potential challengers in this potential set. What is the potential set? Set of all possible arms, I, such that the lower confidence, such that, okay, this is the set of all possible arm, I, such that the upper confidence bound on its mean is larger than the lower confidence bound on the best of the mean of the best peaceable arm. Okay, so these are potentially good, potentially best peaceable arms. We just haven't ascertained that to be the case. All right, so we continue pulling, pulling arms until the potential set is empty or there is no more, uh, and there is no more uh, possibly feasible arm. So that's the termination condition. Basically, this says that if there is no more challenger, as in the previous slide here, and there's no more challenger, then there's no one to challenge the best piece of arm and we can safely output. Okay, so our analysis basically uh, involves enhancing and deploying uh, the analysis of LUCB in a pretty old paper. Okay, so yes. You mentioned about leader and challenger. But yeah. Which arm are you pulling at every challenge? Oh, we put, we put both the leader and the challengers. Oh, so okay. two, two at each time. Thanks, thanks for the question. I didn't say that. Okay. So, uh, so basically, we were. Uh, so, in the next few, in the next couple of slides or so, we, we will analyze the time complexity, but of course, I will not go into all the details. All right. So, this is basically now another illustration of, of, of arms that are in the current risky set. Okay. So, this is the empirical version of risky set. This is, these are the arms in the empirical uh, safe set, and these are the empirical neutral arms. Okay? So, um, okay. So, when do we terminate? When do we terminate? We terminate when we are very confident that there is no more challenger. Okay? When the po empirically potential best feasible arm set is empty, then our algorithm should stop. Okay, you can look at the figure here. If we have successfully identified a particular arm whose neighborhood here has no more competing arms, so this part here is empty, all right? Then that is when we should stop, okay? We don't have really have to understand this uh, notation here. Okay, so what we can show is that on the event E, which is the typical event, all right? If the algorithm does not terminate, then I can find at least one arm that is the empirically best piece of arm together with a challenger arm in this set here. So we basically need to compute the number of arm pools such that, okay, and this set here is basically the neighborhood set. There's something in the neighborhood, this, this green part here. So we just have to compute the number of pools of each arm I such that the confidence intervals are sufficiently small so that, the, so that this particular neighborhood turns out to be empty. We have to take care, okay, yes and no. We have to take care of the fact that we are not just looking at the best arm, but we also need to take care of feasibility. Yeah, best yeah. meaning, that Yeah, so we arm will, not be thrown out. We will not be thrown out, yes, we will not be thrown out. All the others will, be, will eventually be thrown out, but we need to make sure, we need basically to count how many pools we need in order to make sure that everything else that is either infeasible or suboptimal is effectively thrown out. Okay, so, um, so we can basically say, we, can, we want to prove the following, okay? This small little lemma. Saying that, okay, on the event E, the probability that uh, our algorithm does not terminate can be upper bounded by this quantity here, all right? As long as the t here, as long as the number of time steps is bigger than this number here that does not depend on t. Okay, and the analysis here basically stitches together all the analysis of checking for feasibility as well as checking for suboptimality. That explains the four elements in the hardness parameter. Okay, so 
in the remaining time that I have, which is quite a lot, 10 minutes, I'm going to do the following experiment. So here we have an upper bound on the stopping time, which, is, uh, which comprises these four terms here. So we are going to design experiments to try to understand whether or not the dependence on each of the terms, uh, each of the terms right here is fundamental or is, and is correct. Okay, actually, we already know that it's correct because there's a corresponding lower bound. But what we are going to do is to vary the instance in a systematic manner so as to only vary the gap one by one. And we are going to plot the stopping time as a function of the hardness parameter. Okay, I'm going to make this clear in a moment. For example, we, only will, we want to change delta i star, which appears here in red. And we want to observe how the sample complexity changes as a function of the hardness parameter. Or more precisely, the hardness parameter, log the hardness parameter divided by delta, which is what is predicted by the theory. So when we change this, and if we plot the sample complexity of stopping time against this quantity, we should see a straight line. Okay, because that's what the theory predicts. And so here what we have done, and you don't need to pass all the cases here, all the cases here correspond to all the different deltas here. Okay, so that's the, I'm not going to go through each one of them. But basically, we run our algorithm and we look at the sample complexity. The empirical sample complexities are all those little dots here together with their confidence. We run this many times and we, we basically average and display the confidence widths as well. So that this, there's the data. And we do a linear fit and we see that uh, it's pretty consistent with the, uh, the experiments are pretty consistent with theory. Okay. All right. So, so let's look at some competing algorithms. Okay. So the baseline is basically let's just pull everything uniformly at random. There is actually another algorithm out there by uh, David Adele called risk averse UCBBAI. Okay, it is basically a UCB type algorithm. There's no challenger. Okay, and basically they do this at each point in time. All right, the possibly feasible, sorry, this is the uh, empirically feasible set. They pull upper confidence bound. They pull the arm that maximizes upper confidence bound on the mean. Okay, they determine when the confidence radius of the mean is below a certain threshold. That unfortunately has to be chosen as a function of the instance. So, it's not completely parameter free, but never mind. Let's compare to it. But notice that the difference, okay, that's why I said it's not completely parameter free. They have to find an epsilon approximate feasible and an epsilon mu approximately optimal arm. But this procedure involves knowing hardness parameter, the hardness parameter. Okay? Turns out that the upper bound is greater than that of our algorithm. And they also have a lower bound that is also looser for almost all instances. Okay. The main difference here is that there is no challenger pulling. And so let's see the empirical performance okay, on a particular instance that we constructed here. All right, so uh, here, focus on this plot here. There are 10 instances, just focus on any one of the, uh, any one of the bar plots here. The shorter, the better. So what, what, what are we displaying here? The left line, the left, line, left bar here is, our, is the stopping time of our algorithm. The red line is the stopping time of this David's algorithm, David Adele's algorithm, risk averse UCBAI. And the worst one is, of course, uniform pulling. So among all these instances, we see that our algorithm uh, results in the uh, faster stopping time, uh, which is good news. Okay? So this LUCB property, LUCB uh, algorithm seems to be working okay. All right, so... Um, this brings me to the end of my talk, actually. Okay, so here I propose a problem that involves trying to find the best arm among k different arms. But there's a certain twist to it. I want to find the arm that is feasible. Feasible in the sense that its variance is not larger than a permissible upper bound on the, on the variance. Because I want to get to my office in time without too much stress. Okay? So I develop a, my collaborators and I develop an algorithm, VALUCB, that basically involves uh, carefully analyzing whether or not there is still a challenger within, this, uh, within, the feasible, within the empirically feasible set. 
Okay, we and we try to eliminate all these other suboptimal or infeasible arms. This results in a hardness parameter that is very meaningful, as I showed you. Every term has a meaning. And not, not only that, it has a meaning. We can also derive an information theoretic lower bound, and it matches up to constants. And the performance of our algorithm matches the information theoretic lower bound up to log terms. So this is not this is still not very ideal, all right? This is still not very ideal because uh, we are still missing constants, all right? And some people care about constants. It may be possible to nail down the constants through tracking-based risk-constrained BAI algorithms that we have not explored, at, at least we have not explored at this point in time. And this is something that uh, we hope to do, but we do not know how to do at this point in time, all right? So we want to try to improve the constants because those are things that people really care about here and it's possible to do in the unconstrained case. So that is future work one, which is the main future work. Other feedback models may also be interesting for us to look at. So yeah, this brings me to the end of my talk and hopefully you, you at least got the model and you at least got some elements of the algorithm and some elements of the analysis of the algorithm. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, from what I understand, uh, the whole point of having a challenger is to decide when the gap is large enough to reduce. Yes, Correct? exactly. Okay. Yeah. So now is the idea of having challenger in your contribution or was it known in the No, it was previous contribution, but we just incorporated it to we just incorporate it together with a, the variance. Uh, one, one or two questions, yeah. Uh, so this limiting to zero one defines the hardness measure, right? It's somewhat restrictive, right? If I just don't assume bounded support, you'll have a totally different hardness measure. Uh, without uh, the gap square, I believe. Sorry, what were you saying? Delta so going to zero or what? No, no, just zero to one, you're restricting the support, right? If ah, I don't. Okay, okay. Zero to one restricted the support. Those, that can be relaxed, I think. Yeah, if you relax, your hardness measure would change, right? You no longer would have the gap square, but maybe some KL terms will come and things like that. Mm, I think the gap square will still be present. What needs to change is the bound on the variance, the uh, concentration bound on the variance. There we basically use McDiarmid's. All right, so we need uh, something. We need something that's amenable to unbounded support random variables. Like if I you, believe that the hardness parameter will still be the same up to some constants. Yeah, because if you compare like uh, with the track and stop world, uh, you have the KLs in the unbounded support. You don't have the gap. Usually with Bernoulli, you get these. Yeah, gaps. but the tracking type algorithms give you better, much much better performance in the sense that uh, they are up, they are tied up to constants as well. Correct, okay. but their gap is also like the hardness measure does not involve this kind of a gap, whatever you're talking well, about. But this KL and KL and these gap squared, they are almost the same up to con some constants. Right? Yeah, to, constants. To, yeah. But for exponential families at least. Yeah, and the other thing is would the algorithm change if it is unbounded support? No, it will not change. The algorithm won't change. Yeah, I, I don't think we have to change it. We have to change the analysis. Okay, so okay. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. This sigma bar squared upper bounded by a quarter is basically due to the fact that we assume a bounded support. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you have this concentration bound for variance and that you are able to do this and this is a constant. Similar mm -hmm. bounds for any other risk measure. Mm -hmm. Everything else goes through. Yeah. So, what is the state of the art in concentration? Oh, you should ask Prashant, he's the expert. <laughs> <laughs> so Prashant has a, let, let me try to advertise his book. So whatever risk measure you have, okay, as long as it's Lipschitz, all right, then we have some concentration bound for it and you can plug that into any sort of regret, any sort of regret minimization algorithm for, for multi arm bandits. So you will see the Lipschitz constant appear somewhere. You may see some other powers appear somewhere. But if you have good enough concentration bounds, you can basically use that within a, a regret minimization uh, algorithm. Uh, Prashant has a very nice GMLR paper on that. So I believe that we can possibly leverage those concentration bounds to enhance the variance bound here, the, the concentration bound on the variance here. Uh, risk measure is Lipschitz, then you can cover most of the if the risk measure is Lipschitz and the distribution is sub Gaussian, then you can replace the variance by those risk measures. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And the Lipschitzness is with respect to vast strain distance. Catch me offline for the details. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's the expert on that. What, what risk measures 
is one thing that satisfies mean ah. obviously satisfies petrol risk measure distortion risk measure satisfy there are some more names which are, okay utility based shortfall risk one risk measure that does not satisfy is prospect theory yeah okay yeah